In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus came down with the twelve and stopped at a piece of level ground where there was a large gathering of his disciples with a great crowd of people from all parts of Judea and from Jerusalem and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Then fixing his eyes on his disciples, he said, How happy are you who are poor! Yours is the kingdom of God. Happy you are hungry now, you shall be satisfied. Happy you who weep now, you shall laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, drive you out, abuse you, denounce your name as criminal on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice when that day comes and dance for joy, for then your reward will be great in heaven. This was the way their ancestors treated the prophets. But alas for you who are rich, you are having your consolation now. Alas for you who have your fill now, you shall go hungry. Alas for you who laugh now, you shall moan and weep. Alas for you when the world speaks well of you, this was the way their ancestors treated the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, dear God's family, the passage of the Gospel we have read today is the beginning of a long discourse of Jesus which has been called the Sermon on the Mount. This first part of Jesus' discourse has been given the name the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude stands for blessings. This part of Jesus' discourse, the Beatitudes, is found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Luke's Gospel, from which today's passage has been taken, gives only four blessings, followed by four woes or cursings. The blessings are the following. How blessed are you who are poor! Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people persecute you. And the woes, what to you who are rich? What to you who have your fill? What to you who laugh now? What to you who are praised by men? Matthew gives the first four blessings of Luke, but adds four more. He adds the following. Blessed are the gentle, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew also adds some words to the first and second blessings of Luke. To the words poor, he adds the word poor in spirit. To the word hungry, he adds those who hunger and thirst for what is right. Jesus might have announced these beatitudes more than once, and that accounts for the differences between Matthew and Luke. Now let us come to the Beatitudes themselves. The first thing that you notice is this. No one on earth ever announced what Jesus proclaims in the Beatitudes. Were we to ask a hundred persons, do you want to be happy? All of them would hasten to reply, what a question to ask. Of course, we want to be happy. Everyone longs for happiness. Again, were we to ask them to draw up a list of things which they, in their opinion bring happiness to a person, most of them would include the following, money, good health, happy family, secure job, nice house, good friends, and so on. You can be sure that no one would leave money out of the list and that most will put it at the head of it. Anyone listening for the first time to the words of Jesus, happy you who are poor, you who are hungry, you who weep, would exclaim, what? The person who said such a thing must have been out of his mind. No one considers those who are poor, those who go hungry or are persecuted, lucky people. Such people are to be considered unfortunate, worthy of compassion, but unfortunate. And they are never, ever lucky people. 
we cannot blame such people for reacting that way. In fact, someone has called the eight Beatitudes the eight mad statements of Jesus. Only in the light of faith in Christ do the Beatitudes have meaning. From the human point of view, they run counter to all that everyone considers blessings. Now it is good to begin shedding light on the Beatitudes, that is, what was Jesus teaching? Especially when he said, blessed are the poor. What Jesus meant by that teaching? Let us start by saying what Jesus did not mean when proclaiming the Beatitudes. Before we try to explain what Jesus meant when announcing the Beatitudes, let us make clear what he did not mean. Many people easily misunderstand what Jesus said. For instance, Jesus never meant to say that to be poor, to weep, to go hungry, or to be persecuted are good things. God never planned such things for man. Man brought them upon himself through sin. Instead, Jesus wants us to do all in our power to escape poverty, to improve our standard of living, and so on. During his life on earth, Jesus did experience hunger on occasions, for instance, in the desert. But he also fed the crowd that went hungry after listening to his preaching, that he said, no, no, it is not right to send them that way. He fed them. During his life, Jesus witnessed sorrow in abundance, and the gospel repeatedly tells us that he felt truly sorry at the sight of people who suffer. For instance, on seeing the widow of nine accompanying her son to be buried, but he hurried to console the woman and brought joy back to her by raising her son back to life. <coughs> Jesus enjoyed a good meal laughed as we do, enjoyed the hospitality of Lazarus and his sisters, and gratefully accepted the service of some good women who provided him with what he needed, according to Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. In a word, to lack the necessities of life, to go hungry, to be afflicted, persecuted, and so on, were for Jesus two bad things, just as they are for us. So what was he Jesus meaning? Probably Prophet Jeremiah can help us to understand the meaning of the Beatitudes. In the first Sunday, or the first reading of this Sunday, the Prophet Jeremiah seems to have a blessing on one hand and a curse on the other. He curses the person who puts his trust in man and blesses him who puts his trust in the Lord. The words to trust in man and to put one's trust in self, in money, possessions, in people who are powerful in man's eyes and so on, that is the meaning of the term to trust in man. People who do so feel that they hardly need God and they can do all things by themselves. In a way, such people make themselves gods and worship themselves. Jeremiah compares such people to a bush that grows in the desert. It yields no fruit, provides no shade, is full of thorns, and hurts anyone coming in contact with it. On the contrary, people who put their trust in the Lord are aware of their own weakness, are convinced that God is ready to lend them his own strength at all times, they know what it is to be at the mercy of powerful and wicked people. They also know that God loves them and will eventually save them from oppression. For such people as these, Jeremiah says, Jeremiah, the Lord is what a river is for a tree planted on its bank, the source of their life and of fruitfulness. And because such people know what suffering means, they are compassionate with those who suffer and are all at all times ready to help others. In other words, such people yield fruit, good quality and abundant fruit, the fruit of brotherly love. It is such people that Jesus calls in the Beatitudes happy, lucky. Blessed are you who are poor, you who weep, 
you who go hungry and persecuted. They represent people who trust the Lord, who put their trust in the Lord, than in their own strength and power and possessions. In fact, to be poor means to be dependent on God in the scriptures. In a way, all the Beatitudes are contained in the first one. Blessed you who are poor. In the mind of Jesus, those are genuinely poor who are convinced of their own weakness and sinfulness, convinced that their weaknesses and sins are the only things they can really claim as their own. Those are poor who gladly acknowledge that whatever they possess, life, health, intelligence, money, goods of any kind, are not really theirs, but given to them by God. In the opinion of Jesus, those are poor who are hungry with what they possess, who are happy with what they possess, grateful to God for it all, and are not over-anxious to obtain what they do not have. Hence, their trust in God remains unshaken even when experiencing material losses. Those are genuinely poor, who rather than envy what other people have, are ready to share what they have with the people in, ha- in need. Those are poor who realize that money and possession, no matter how abundant, are like a reed, not to be relied upon. The reed easily breaks, hurting the one who leans on it. The poor instead put their trust in the Lord, who never falls. The rich who rely on themselves are like the grass on the field. They are there today, and tomorrow they are gone, and no one knows even the place that they stood. To be truly poor means to be convinced that not even all the gold of the world can buy one's own salvation. We are saved only by God's love. We are saved by faith. We are saved by faith working in love. The poor are those who walk towards death without regret or fear, happy to leave earthly possessions behind, certain of obtaining eternal life. We could go on describing What makes a person genuinely poor? What we have said until now suffices to lead to us another important uh, conclusion. That is, it is not easy to be genuinely poor. We must go on through life learning to be so, to be humble, to be reliant on God. Only the Holy Spirit within us can lead us to become poorer day after day. That is, humble, dependent on God. There can be, secondly, there can be people with money and possessions who are nevertheless poor, while there can be beggars who are not poor. These often long for wealth, thus becoming both materially and spiritually poor. In the mind of Jesus, we are truly poor when convinced that we are truly a bundle of needs, which only God in his love can give, can satisfy, Without God, we are nothing. Now, people, materially poor, often have an advantage over the wealthy in entering the kingdom. Jesus calls the poor happy for one reason, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus does not say that the kingdom will be theirs, but that it is theirs already. They already possess it. They possess it because, acknowledging their own weakness, Put, they put their trust in God alone by placing themselves under God's loving rule as a child runs to take shelter in the arms of his father. And this is what to enter into God's kingdom really means, to put oneself under God's loving rule. The rest is a question of time. While in this world we possess God's kingdom only partially, on reaching heaven we shall possess it fully and forever. The reason for this is simple. In heaven, our trust in God will become total and complete. But while on earth, the treasure of God's kingdom aroused to the extent in which we place our trust in God. And often we have trouble in placing our trust in God. Now here comes the point. The materially poor, people having no one to turn to in this world, find it easier to turn to God and put their trust in him, while the rich, the materially rich, feel the need for God less urgent. The gospel and the history of the church 
are a proof of what we are saying. The poor, the landless people of Palestine found Jesus' teachings appealing and accepted them with joy. While the religious leaders, wealthy as they were, rejected him and his teaching. Going back to the days when the gospel was first announced in our village, the first to accept it were neither the rich nor the learned, but the simple, the unlearned, the poor among us. St. Paul recalled this into the mind of his uh, Christians of Corinth when he wrote to them, Brothers, at the time when you were called, how many of you were wise by human standards? How many influential people or came from noble families? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. The evident answer is, very few. Very few of them were wise. Very few of them were influential people or from noble families or rich. Time and again, history repeats itself. No one on reaching heaven will regret having been poor by living in this world. We need not always go hungry, mourning or persecuted, but we have to be poor at all times, that is conscious of our great weakness and glad to depend on God if we want to be saved. A group of Christians in the community of Corinth had been led astray by some teacher or other who had raised doubts in their minds as to whether the dead would rise again. St. Paul hastened to strengthen their faith with a powerful argument. If the dead do not rise, neither did Christ rise from the dead. And if Christ did not rise, then our faith in him is groundless. We would better start enjoying life in any way we can as non-Christians do. But Christ did rise, says St. Paul. Because he did, his suffering and death have meaning. They brought us salvation, and so our own sufferings and privations have meaning as well. Joined to those of Christ, they not only yield the fruit of our own salvation, but also become a source of salvation, joy for others, and joy within us. St. Paul speaks of himself, says, In all my troubles, I am filled with consolation, and my joy is overflowing. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. So we pray, Father in heaven, help us to make use of our gifts in accordance with your will. Help us to detach our hearts from material goods and to set them on the treasures of your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. For Philopia, lover of God. 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 Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philopea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philopea. Oh, Philopea, lover of God, pray to Mary, help of Christians. Philopea, lover of God, pray to Mary, help of Christians. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philopea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philopea. Lover of God, sing with angels and praise our God. Oh, 
Philothea, lover of God, sing with angels and praise our God. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea. Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea. O Saint Francis of the Cells, we live your teachings through Philothea. Saint Francis of the Cells, we live your teachings through Philothea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Yesu, Viva, live in Jesus, Philothea.